Hi, my name is Paris Wolf, and today we're going to be learning about cryptography. I'm going to go through questions 31 through 40 on the practice test here. Question 31. Which, component, which four components involved in performing encryption are known to the party that will perform the encryption with counter cipher mode? So the party that's going to be performing the encryption will need to know the cryptographic algorithm, the cryptographic key, the plain text that they're going to be encrypting, and the nonce value since it's counter mode, counter mode use the nonce value. Now, if the question was rephrased to which two components involved in performing encryption are known to the party that will perform decryption before symmetric encryption is applied, so before, it would only be the cryptographic algorithm and the cryptographic key. If it was after, then it would depend on which uh, cipher mode they would need. But um, they would certainly need to know the cryptographic algorithm, the cryptographic key, and the initialization vector if it was like a cipher feedback, for example. So again, with counter mode, these this is the answer here. Question 32. Employee C wants to send employee D an email. Which key would be used to encrypt the message? So employee C is going to encrypt this email with employee D's public key. And then employee D is going to decrypt this message with their private key. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption always uses two keys, a public key and a private key. And every individual in the company that is using the like an email exchange server, they're going to use a public and private key. With symmetric key, you may see that term as uh, both a shared key or private and private key. So they would decrypt it with their private key and uh, the, and then the other side would be private key as well. But that would mean that they're using the same algorithm and everything is exactly the same on those symmetric keys. Uh, typically, you do see it as a sh the term shared key, though. Question 33. What would happen to the hash of a file if it is rehashed after the first character of the file is changed? So one thing as an engineer... Um, I want you to be able to go investigate and look things up. And that's what it takes to be a, a really, really good engineer because a lot of the times you're just going to be looking up things. So let's take a look at that. If you don't know how to do something, then take a look here on Google and how to get the hash of a file on PowerShell. Take a look here. Get file hash. Okay, so this is the syntax here. Get file hash. So now we're going to go over to PowerShell. And we're going to type in get. And as we're starting to type it in, I'm using the PowerShell ISE. It starts to fill it out for us. And you can click on there. And now the path. Well, if you're not too, you're not exactly sure where the path is, you can go into the folder here, find the document that you want to um, hash. And in this case, we're going to use this Word document. And I'm going to left click it. And no boom, rename. No, just taking a look at all the options here. Oh, here it is, copy as path. So we're going to copy as path, minimize this here. I'm going to control V it into this path here. And what is the rest of this syntax here? We're going to go back to the Microsoft here. And at the end, path. And then you see the string. We don't need that. We just need this algorithm here. Okay, so let's put that into, see, we start to type it out. And now it gives us all the different options here. So a lot of times you're going to be learning things like deprecated hashes. And uh, and then we're also going to be teaching the different the new ones. Or And the reason why that's really important is because all these IT systems, they they give you all of the options of old to new. So when you're setting up a new system, um, the reason why it would have some of these older systems or options like MD5 or you're going to see like DES if you want to encrypt something it is deprecated is because what if you need backwards compatibility? So in some places, like let's say you're working in a hospital, they buy this really expensive $30 million machine and they don't want to replace that. 
And so they're, they, you're just going to use older IT algorithms or systems or operating systems. And, and that's why they still give you these options here. So in this case here, um, we're going to pick SHA-256 and we'll just tab that out. And we're going to get the hash of this file here. So the output's here. And now we want to open this file up. Okay, so we're just going to change the first character and we're going to put a space on the first character of this file. We're going to save it and then we're going to X out of it. And now if you just push the, the up arrow on the PowerShell, it's going to repeat the com previous command or it's going to go into the history. And now, as you can see, we just changed only the first character. We put a space and the hash outputs a completely different output. So if you just change one character on this, on a hash, it's going to completely show a different answer. Okay, so the answer is the entire hash is different. Question 34, what is the output length of SHA? So I'm just gonna show you the diagram here of oh, 160 bits and here's what the hashes look like. So an MD5 is gonna be 128 bits or 32 hexadecimals, and the SHA is 160 bits. So bits are just ones and zeros, and the hexadecimal, this is what the hexadecimal looks like. So there's 40 characters here. And each of these individual, like the five, this is made up of four, um, four numbers here. And so if you broke this down on then a D, so there's four, binary numbers and then underneath the D we'd take a look and see okay we're looking for a boom and then this would be 1101 and so this would be eight characters and so that's why it's 32 times 4 is this 128 bits because you're just seeing this 32 characters but really it's 128 bits made up of these and this one here is 160 bits so again, the answer, what is the output length of SHA? That's 160 bits. And for MD5, that's 128 bits. Question 35, what is a LM password? Oh, hash password. So out of the two definitions here, um, used in Microsoft Windows to store passwords that are 14 characters or less, yes, that is a LM hash password. And then the other option here, each input of the passwords are converted to Unicode. So let me go ahead and show you what an a, um, LM hash looks like. And this is what a MTLM hash looks like. So as you can see, the um, LM had a lot of weaknesses because the link could only be 14 characters or less, or less than 15 characters. And so they updated it to this newer hashing algorithm for the NTLM. However, the issue is that it sits right next to the LM. So if you take a look here, it has the same hash and then it has the colon. So the NTLM has these colons in it while other hashes like LM or SHA um, or MD, they don't have any hashes within the output there. And so the weakness here is that this is weak against dictionary lookups. And so is this LM hash. Let's see here. Do I have any other notes here? No. Answer, used in Microsoft Windows to store passwords that are 14 characters or less. What is bcrypt? So bcrypt specifically is a hash generator for passwords that uses salt to create non-reoccurring passwords. While um, like SHA or MD5, those are going to be general purpose hashing algorithms. So Bcrypt is still a hashing algorithm, how it's specifically used with passwords. And so let's say you're logging into a website of Amazon.com. Well, when you type in your, your password of uh, monkey10, it's going to add additional salt, which is additional characters to your password, and then run that through a hashing algorithm. And it, it's just more secure that way. 37. Is a rainbow table attack online or offline? So a rainbow table is 
attack is offline. And how that works is whenever you are logging into, let's say, Amazon.com, and you put your username in, and then you put your password in, they don't store your password because that would be dangerous if somebody got a hold of your username and password within their database. And so what they do is they take that password and they add the salt to it and then they store and then run it through a hash and then that's how they store it in their database. The way when, when you do log in, they're able to verify you are um, and authenticate you. However, so this rainbow attack is referring to a bad actor has broken into their database and now um, they have saved that database onto their own computer system and they're going to be they're using this rainbow table which is a list of pre-computed hashes and comparing that to the stolen data that they have and see if they can identify if any of those rainbow tables are the same as that hashed um, database that they have access to and if they can then try to go back and use your username and password to log in by kind of like a reversed lookup between the rainbow table and um, the database that they've broken into that's now stored onto their computer system. So again, the rainbow table attack is offline. 38, how does the ECB work? So this is a pretty, um, complicated mode here, block cipher mode or the ciphers in general. Um, whenever you see these cipher modes, I, the analogy I would like to use is it's kind of like a math algorithm where you have like multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, and it, it tells the um, encryption and how the data is going to like the order of operations. And so this is the most simple cipher mode here and block one here. That's referring to this is just data, the first set of data. And it here with the key, this is a encryption method such as advanced encryption standard. And so it's taking the data, it's encrypting that, and then it's outputting this cipher text. So what you really need to know about electronic codebook, um, this was the original cipher mode that they have, and that it's weak. Each block is processed separately. So if you had the same verbiage in block one, like the house is green and the house is green in block two and block one, this ciphertext is going to be exactly the same, um, which creates a weakness in the encryption and the cipher. And so there's no salting or initialization vector. And so that's why it says the same ciphertext will be output every time um, the same plain text is encrypted. And that's very dangerous. And so now this is outdated. So question 39, how does cipher block chaining work? Well, let's take a look at the uh, diagram here. So with cipher block chaining, we have the block one of data. That's just the first set of data. And then it gets put into, it gets, here's the initialization vector. So I wanna take a look over here and imagine this is the block one of data and then here, the initialization vector. So the first set of the initialization vector is completely ran randomized and generated. And so it takes the data and it compares that to the initialization vector. And depending on which operator you're using, like and, if both the one and one, then it outputs the one. If it's a one and zero, it outputs a zero. So then once this data comes down, goes through this initialization vector, it then, this third line here, or the output gets encrypted with whichever algorithm that you use, like AES, creating this cipher one text. Now this cipher one text now it follows this line over here and block two is now going to use the cipher one as the initialization vector. So it, it's exactly the same here, but now all the blocks are dependent on each other from the previous block because this ciphertext is going to be the same exact size as the next set of data in block two. And so I just want to take a little bit more uh, time here with the and or and uh, ex except or and take a look at these different options here. And because you, you may get something like this on your test here. So with a one and a one, um, only with one, only one or the other have to be a one for the um, one bit to carry on. 
because these are just ones and zeros in, in binary, and one means on and zero means off if, when the machine's reading that. So one and a zero carries down. It's a one and a one, okay? So or pr pretty simple. And the except or is one and a one, comes down to a zero, one and a zero, one, one and a one, zero, zero and a zero. So you, you do have to memorize these because these are very, very probable that you're going to have something like this uh, as a question. So question number 40. So I want you to match the definition. Okay, so ECB or electronic codebook that encrypts each block with the same key where each block is independent of the others. And if we go back up to here, they're independent because they don't rely on each other like the cipher block chaining where it's really depending on the previous cipher. So ECB would be encrypts each block with the same key where each block is independent of the others. The cipher block chaining uses an initialization vector to encrypt the first block and then uses the result of the encryption to encrypt the next block. Okay, yeah, we just went over that. And it's using the pre previous cipher to encrypt the next block here. So block two, and then it gets um, Zord with the cipher one, and then after the output, it's getting encrypted and turning into cipher two, and so on and so on until the uh, message is complete. We'll just take a look at all the answers here. Um, so for cipher feedback mode, uses a self-synchronizing stream on the blocks where the initialization vector is encrypted and Zord with the data stream. And on the future future questions here. Um, oh, this should say question 40, but that's okay. On the future questions, I'm going to go over um, cipher feedback mode and counter mode. And counter mode converts the from block into stream and then uses a counter value and nonce to encrypt the data.